Thank you all for being here remotely today. Uh, my job is to discuss the carbon indicators that we measure as part of this project. And uh, during my talk today, I'll introduce the indicators, examine their relationship with each other and with climate and soil properties, and evaluate their response to management, and then finish with a discussion of our preliminary evaluation of these indicators. So first, just a little background on why we care about carbon in agricultural soils. For the decades that we've been studying soil health, there's been a recognition that organic matter is central to the concept. And the elemental composition of organic matter is about 50% carbon. So talking about organic matter means talking about carbon. And the reason that carbon is so central is because it's linked to so many other aspects of soil health. And I'll talk about just a few here today. So uh, organic matter in soils is typically negatively charged. So nutrients like ammonium and potassium and calcium that are positively charged will stick to it, as will water. So more carbon in the soil means more nutrients and more water in the soil for crops. Some of these organic molecules are sticky and act as glue to stick together mineral particles in the soil, creating soil structure and aggregation. Soil carbon is the basis of the microbial community, is the food for microbial, the microbial community and the whole food web in the soil. <coughs> uh, increased soil carbon has been associated with increased yield in cropping systems. And finally, more carbon in soils means less CO2 in the atmosphere. And I could go on and on talking about the importance of carbon in agricultural soils. But so what is this organic carbon in soils? So the key point is that it's organic carbon, so it's derived from living organisms. And that might mean it's from plant stems or leaves that senesce and are added at the soil surface or are incorporated by tillage. It could mean roots that are dying within the soil profile, or it could be the small organic molecules that are uh, excreted by soil roots to influence the soil and microbial communities around them. But while this organic carbon starts as coming from plants, the uh, microbes alter this carbon. And so they uh, eat some of it, they change some of it, and so they leave behind a whole suite of microbial organic compounds in the soil. Second, all carbon storage in soils is temporary. So it might just be minutes or days or century or millennia, but all of the carbon in the soil, soil only stays there until it is physically accessible and energetically favorable for a microbe to eat. That being said, small changes in carbon dynamics can lead to big changes in soil carbon when we're thinking of all of the cropland in North America. Finally, we can easily measure the total amount total amount of organic carbon in soils by dry combustion, but we're often interested in more detail about what this carbon is like. However, there are thousands of plant and microbial compounds that we could think to measure. So we often identify subsets of the total carbon based on operational properties of these. It might be physical, where we can physically separate the size fraction, so the sand cell clay, and look at the carbon in those different physical size fractions, or it can be a, a chemical extraction, or it can be measuring biological assays to, to get into the details of this carbon. So in the talk today, I'm going to address five questions. First, what are the carbon indicators that we chose in this project and what are their typical values? Two, can we describe trends and in indicators with climate or inherited soil properties? Three, how are the indicators related to each other? Four, what is the sensitivity of the indicators to management? And then five, how do we pick an indicator? So what are the indicators that are part of this project related to carbon? So there's eight that I'm gonna be talking about today. The first one is soil organic carbon that we measure with dry combustion. That's uh, been, as uh, Dr. Morgan said, it's a tier one indicator, it's been used for a long time. But we also measured the active carbon, and this is carbon that's 
that's oxidized by the chemical permanganate. We can measure uh, the water extractable organic carbon. So this is just as it sounds. We shake the, the soil and water and see how much carbon comes out. We can use the phospholipid fatty acid analysis to quantify microbial biomass in the soil. So it's another chemical extraction of the soil, but indicating the living biomass. We can look at the autoclave citrate extractable uh, protein index or ACE. And, as, and this is typically thought of as a nitrogen indicator, but protein like most organic compounds is about half nitrogen. So I've included it here. And then in blue at the bottom are three that are more biological assays. So there's two metrics of soil respiration, one that's a 24 hour assay and one that's a 96 hour assay. And then finally, uh, measured the activity of an enzyme produced mostly by microbes that degrades carbon called beta glucosidase. And in case you missed the earlier talks today, these indicators were measured on 2000 experimental plots to a depth of 15 centimeters at one time point, and typically right before planting in spring. And so these represent just under 700 management systems at over 120 sites. And all of these indicators can be measured on air dried soils, except for the PLFAs, which were measured on freeze dried soils. So just to give you an example of one of these indicators, here's soil organic carbon and percent, and just the frequency uh, that we saw these values of carbon across the 2000 samples that we measured. And so the distribution is, is pretty normal. The mean is about 1.6% carbon, or for those of you who think in organic matter, it's about 2.8% organic matter. Um, but you can see there are a handful of samples that are 4% or higher. And for full disclosure, there are three sites in Canada that for various reasons have much higher organic carbon, uh, five and even up to 10% organic carbon um, that I've excluded from the plots that I'm showing you today, just because there's such different sites. So when we look at these uh, eight indicators, I'm showing you the typical values and the variability in them, just to give you a sense of, of, of what they look like. And then the uh, units for these are shown on the right. And just to highlight again, the top ones are looking at some pool of carbon and per kilogram of soil, whereas the lower ones, uh, the more biological ones are rates. So it's some amount of carbon per kilogram soil per time, either per day or per hour. And then finally on this slide is the price of these indicators if you were to send them to a commercial or a university lab for analysis. And the main thing to notice is that that PLFA analysis is much more expensive than the other ones. And there is a small range in, in cost um, from about 15 to $25 for these other indicators, but, but, but similar range. So, so what do these indicators look like on a geographic scale? As I mentioned before, we know the most about soil organic carbon of all of these indicators. It's been measured at thousands or tens of thousands of locations all over, the, all over North America. Here I'm just showing uh, a map of the United States with data from the rapid carbon assessment on soil carbon. But the main thing I want you to notice from here from the colors is that that we've known for a long time that soil forming factors affect soil organic carbon. So for the purposes of our project, you can see that if you were in the Northeastern United States or the uh, Northwestern United States, where the, there's uh, greenish blue colors, that carbon is higher where the temperature is cool and wet. In the arid Southwest in the Great Basin, where it's dry and hot, the amount of carbon is lower in the soils. You can also see the effects of parent materials. So the sand hills of Nebraska stand out here where the coarse soils there just have much less carbon in it than the uh, surrounding areas of the Great Plains. And so we can use our data set to look at some of those same predictors. So on the left, I'm showing soil organic carbon versus mean annual temperature of the site. 
on the right is soil organic carbon versus clay. And as we would expect, there's, we can predict to some extent carbon from these, these factors or these variables associated with soil forming factors. So we can explain about 20% of the carbon with mean annual temperature and about 10% of the carbon with clay. And so the other thing you'll notice is there's a lot of variability around that line. And we'll get back to that variability in a little bit when we talk about management. Uh, I'm not showing the other indicators to you today, but they don't tend to have quite a strong predictability with these climate and soil texture variables. So next, how are all these climate indicators related to each other? So this figure is a correlation network and there's two pieces of information that you can extract from this. So one is showing the individual correlations between all eight indicators here, indicated by the colored lines. And then the second is the overall relationship among all of the indicators. So indicators are clustered closer together when the relationships among multiple indicators are more similar. So the first thing I want you to notice is that PLFA microbial biomass stands out as something different. So it's further away from all of the other indicators and all of the correlations are in purple, which indicates relatively low correlations. The, in contrast, the strongest correlation is between soil organic carbon and active carbon. And the fact that they're close together indicates that the relationships of these variables with all of the other variables is also similar. And you can see clusters of other variables, so both with the uh, two respiration measurements and with this enzyme activity in the water extractable organic carbon seem to have similar relationships among all of the variables. Another way to look at these relationships would be to try to predict each indicator from the other seven. So something like a forward selection stepwise regression. So you can select an indicator that predicts the most variation in another, and then you can keep adding indicators that provide additional explanatory variables, additional explanatory power. For four of the indicators, the best first predictor was active carbon. And except for the water extractable organic carbon, there really wasn't much information gained by adding any more indicators after the first one. So it appears these indicators are providing shared information about carbon in our database. So question four was about the relationship between the indicators and management. And the way that I'm going to address that today is with response ratios. And I'm, the graph here is a little bit different than what Dr. Capolazzi showed. So in this case, I'm not comparing them to a, a reference soil and unmanaged grassland. I'm comparing among the soil management systems at the site. So we paired treatments within a site that differed only in these soil health practices. And the four that I'm gonna talk about today are tillage, and this really means decreasing tillage, nutrient type, which means including organic amendments, the crop number, so the diversity of crops in the rotation, and cover crops, so adding cover crops. And so these black circles represent the mean value of, of all the pairs of treatments where, where only tillage varied between them. And similarly, the, this is comparing a, two experimental treatments where they only differed in the addition of, of organic amendments. And the numbers in parentheses here represent the total number of comparisons we can do. So as you can see, it's more than the number of sites. So some sites had multiple comparisons there. And so in this case, a value of zero means that the, uh, the soil health practice and didn't increase, in this case, active carbon. But so what you can see is that for both tillage and cover crops, including those soil health practices, only changing those soil health practices, increased active carbon by just under 
a slightly stronger response for nutrient type, a little over 10%. And there is essentially no change in active carbon by increasing the diversity of the rotation. So if we look at all of the indicators for these four practices, we can see a few things. So the first thing to notice is that um, increased crop number didn't have uh, an effect for any of these indicators. So NS means not significant. So the, in having more species was, did not affect any of these carbon indicators. The second thing to notice is that once again, PLFA microbial biomass seems like it's doing something a little bit different in terms of compared to the other carbon indicators. So it didn't, it's the only one that showed no, no significance in more than two uh, of these management practices. And then finally, if you look down a each of these columns, in general, 24 hour respiration was the most responsive to management. So it was highest, it had the highest response to decreased tillage, the highest response to cover crops, and in the middle for nutrient type. But overall, most of the indicators um, showed a response to each of these, uh, ad adoption of each of these practices on their own. But so that was just talking about the average responses. And so here, if we look at just the response to decreased tillage with active carbon, we can see there's a distribution of responses. So about a third of the responses are actually opposite of, of what we would predict, that active carbon actually uh, active carbon actually decreases when you decrease tillage. And overall, the range was from about a 20% decrease up to about a 100% increase or a doubling of active carbon. And we can start to dig into what might be explaining that with, with some of the same climate and soil texture variables that I was showing you earlier. So once again, this is just looking at active carbon with decreased tillage. And in the left panel, it's looking at the, re at the response ratio compared to uh, the site level precipitation. And in the right panel, it's looking at the percent clay in the soil. And so with precipitation, in general, active carbon, the response of active carbon increased with increasing precipitation. So above about a precipitation of 500 millimeters a year, we predict that active carbon would be greater uh, when you decreased tillage at the site. Similarly for clay, we can see the active carbon is predicted to be greater with decreased, or the response of active carbon is greater with decreased tillage up until you get to about 45% clay. But we still have some work to do um, to explain all of this variability. So there's, there's uh, not everything is falling right on the on the prediction line. Dan, we're getting out of time. Can you just go to your conclusion? Yep. Sorry. Uh, so just to summarize, the indicators are weakly related to climate and heritage soil properties. And the indicators have a medium level of shared information, but active carbon seems to be the best predictor. When we look at the response to management, 24-hour respiration seems to be uh, the most responsive. And then finally, there's some other things that we might want to take into consideration like cost, the availability of labs, the ability to do tests not in a lab, or a response uh, sooner to management. And for both of those, active carbon and 24-hour respiration seem to have the advantages. So with that, I too just want to thank our partnering scientists and our funders, and I'll stop there.